a faint and a free will because people have many questions regarding this topic. When I, in my travels, I come across people. If everything is already destined, you know, then what freedom do we have? People ask this question. Hmm. Uh, because we find that in this world, uh, the face that we have was not designed by us. The parents uh, you have was, was not chosen by you. You were born in a certain family. If everybody was told to choose their parent, probably they will choose the richest man in the world. Probably. But we see that we have been put in a certain family. Uh, we are given a certain type of face cut certain amount of intelligence. Uh, so all these things are like, uh, it appears like pre-designed uh, uh, in our lives. The pigment of uh, skin color. Uh, uh, all these things they seem to be designed and sent already. So what we call as destined. Uh, or it is our fate. And uh, then where is our free will? People ask the question. If, uh, like uh, in this world, you find somebody is born rich, somebody is born poor, somebody is highly educated, somebody is illiterate, somebody is healthy, somebody is diseased. So uh, that kind of disparity is observable in this world. So when we observe these things, we wonder. Sometimes uh, you see a child is born with a silver spoon. Uh, and uh, recently in India, there is a very big uh, multi multi billionaire. His name is Ambani, Anil Ambani. So, this Anil Ambani, Mukesh Ambani, in their family, uh, they, have, they have got a grandchild now, grandson, small baby. But this baby is just about two months old now, two months or three months old. So, as soon as this child opened the eyes, they said, This child is becoming the hair in that family, and he's a billionaire now. As soon as he opened eyes, he's a billionaire. He didn't do any hard work to earn that money. You agree? Right. Correct, no? <laughs> so his only qualification is born in Ambani family, that's all. That's right. uh, he's born with a silver spoon. And there are other children, you see, they are born with some polio attack. You have seen hands are shrunk, one hand is normal, other hand is shrunk. You have seen that? Uh, or sometimes the leg is shrunk or something like that. People wonder why God is cruel, you know, to this innocent child. The child didn't do anything wrong. Why God has given such a body like the people have a question. Uh, but if you refer to the wisdom literature like Gita, for example, Gita says, nothing happens in this world by chance. Everything is a pre-arrangement. Like you go to the airport, the door is opening. You ask a child, how is the door opening? The child may say that because I have to go inside, so therefore the door is opening. Is it correct? Is the door opening just because you have to go in? Or is it a pre-arrangement? What do you think? Is there any pre-arrangement or not? Any of you? Yeah, what is a pre-arrangement? Yeah, anybody knows how the what is the mechanism of the door opening? Sensors, yeah. There are sensors. So when you go and stand there, the sensor's path is blocked. And then the door opens. After you go, again the sensor path is not blocked. Then it closes. So it's a pre-arrangement. Similarly, when a child returns from the school and comes home, on the table he finds some, you know, sandwich and tomato ketchup, some eatable. You ask the child, Hey, as soon as you came from the school, how did you find it on the table? Child may say, because I am hungry, it is there. Is it true? It's not that just because you are hungry, it is there. Mother has made and kept it there. Similarly, in this world, you will see, when we all were born, as soon as you opened your eyes, you saw that the sun shines, and the cloud showers, the grains grow, you know, the fruits ripen, the flowers blossom, the seasons change. None of it is done by us. We are just observing these things. And we are also dependent on nature for all this. These are pre-arrangement. You agree? These are all pre-arrangement done by the Lord. 
Lord is doing all these things, pre arrangement. So, uh, in the same manner, when a child is born, why one child is rich, another child is poor? According to the Gita, uh, we all uh, accrue good and bad activities in um, multiple opportunities given to us. Like for example, each of you sitting here, our, our body is like a field. Hmm? Say a king has a thousand acres of land hmm? and he has given every citizen one one acre of land. You take your piece, he takes his piece, I take my piece. And in that land you are given freedom to cultivate whatever you want. Hmm? Some of them may cultivate paddy, hmm? some of them may cultivate wheat, somebody may cultivate sugar cane. Somebody can cultivate tobacco, somebody can cultivate uh, mango, fruit tree, fruit bearing trees, somebody can cultivate neem fruit trees. And then after you cultivate, the king says, now you have cultivated, you only eat it. And now neem fruit you may not like to eat, but we have only cultivated. Therefore, there is a saying, as you sow, so shall you reap. So, we sow the seed and we reap the fruit subsequently in our lives. So, uh, when we do good in one life, uh, in this life, our lifespan is now 70, 80 or 100 years now. Huh? In this lifespan, the spirit is the indwelling living force in every body. This body is like a car and the spirit is like the driver of the car. Huh? So as long as I am in this bodily car I, uh, or in this field which is given to me, I do good and bad actions and in subsequent life I get the fruits. Huh? Like for example, those who do good activities, they get handsome bodies, they get birth in rich families, they also get good education and they have healthy bodies and they have friendly relations with many and their life is quite smooth sailing. And those who are uh, committing sinful activities, the very simple definition of sin is disobedience to God. Very simple. So there are many... Uh, 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 principles of pure life, I will tell you a little later. Uh, so when you see, then we are preparing our future, somebody gets an unhealthy body with diseases, somebody gets an ugly looking body, somebody is illiterate, somebody is a have not, and they have no money, somebody doesn't get good food, good education like that. So these are uh, visible in this world where we are living, we all can watch it. So as soon as we hear this, uh, we may think that, okay, now I should act virtuously. I should not act viciously. I should act virtuously. That is one lesson people immediately derive when I say this. Because we are the creators of our destiny in future by our thought, word and deed. But here comes the important point uh, about the free will and destiny. Uh, there are two words used in the Vedas. One is called as Karmavad, another one is called as Daivavad. I will tell you the meanings of this. There are one category of people who say, everything is in your hands only. Everything, you work hard and you enjoy. Like that some people say. But uh, the other people who say, everything is destined. Uh, nothing is in our hands. So which of the true, which of the two is true? The first category says, everything is in your hands only. You work hard and you enjoy. You work hard and you enjoy. The second category says, nothing is in your hands. Everything is destined. Like that they say. So which one you think is true? First or second? Yes. Everything is destined. Second? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else wants to add to that? First. Okay. What about both? Both. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Actually, none of them is independently true. It's a combination of both. For example, we sow the seed, God gives the rains. You know, we write the examination paper and the invigilator gives me marks. I give the interview and the panel has to choose me for the job. So it's always a two-way thing. The spirit and God are co-workers. Hmm. Like you all have seen the combination of uh, Krishna and Arjuna in a chariot. You have seen that picture in Bhagavad Gita. Cover page you will find Krishna and Arjuna. Uh, Krishna is the driver 
Narjuna is the passenger sitting. And Krishna is the advisor and Narjuna is the actor. He is the fighter in the battle. So we are like Arjuna and, in, and Krishna is like uh, so God and the soul are co-workers. Which means uh, we do our part, God will do his part. So it's a combination of two. So now let us uh, revisit this uh, understanding of fate and free will. Uh, for example, what is this month going on? It is January now, right? January is ending now. Correct? Uh, today is 31st January, right? Yeah. So all of you have worked for the January month. You are going to get your salary tomorrow, I believe. Huh? 1st February, the salary will enter into your account. Correct, no? When you complete one month, the next month beginning, the salary comes into your account. Similarly, when you live out your life, <coughs> at the end of your life, whatever way you lived your life, the good fruits and bad fruits will be deposited in your account as you begin the next life. And next life means we have body, mind, soul. Huh? Three things. Who are we? Are we the body or the mind or the soul? What do you think? Who are we? Are we the body, mind or spirit? Spirit. Spirit. You are right. Yeah. <coughs> huh? So, the spirit is given two avenues. It is given the mind to, for storing the desires. And it is given the body for exercising the desires. For example, in my mind, I have a desire to play piano. I have a desire. And my fingers and hand helps me to play the piano. So this body is given for exercising the desire. And the mind is given for storing the desire. Is that clear to everybody? And we have many desires we have. Huh? So, like for example, at the end of this program, you will get a very nice dinner, prasadam. So there is a desire in our mind. I like this uh, prasadam snacks. Huh? So you have a desire to eat. And the hand is helping you to eat. So the body is for exercising the desire. And the mind is for storing the desire. So therefore the spirit which is seated in this bodily machine with body and mind, both is our news. Like in a computer, you see there is a hard disk or a microprocessor huh? where you store the software. And then you have servo motors, linear and rotary which moves, correct? Huh? So whatever command you write in the microprocessor, accordingly the machine moves. If any of you have seen a CNC machine, huh? computer network controlled machine, the movements happen based on what you program here. Similarly, whatever desires you are stored in the mind, accordingly our body acts. Hmm? Like our body may act virtuously or viciously, depending on the good or the bad desires we store in the mind. Like you all are coming for this Tuesday program. If you regularly come here, you are going to pick up many good vibes with you. Huh? Many good vibrations will occupy your mind. And then when you go out in the world, you are going to act very virtuously and uh, accrue pure uh, credits. And in case we go to some other place and we pick up many bad vibrations, impure vibrations, then we also act impurely. And then we invite trouble. By that. Is that clear to everybody? This point is clear. <coughs> so, um, so some results come immediately. For example, if I slap someone, they will immediately slap me back. That's why instant <laughs> karma. The instant karma. I slapped him, he slapped me immediately. The reaction came instantly. On the other hand, some results will come little late. For example, today night, uh, if, uh, say, for example, somebody ate at midnight, they went to your hotel and they ate at midnight some very heavy pizza or something. Uh, and next day morning, he may have little trouble because he's eating at midnight or whatever. The results come little later. Simply for the students, if they don't study well throughout the year, you know, then the effect will come in the end of the year when the examinations come. Uh, they won't be able to fail well in the exams because that means they are not studying well, now, the effect is coming after one year. Recently, I was in ISV, uh, San Jose. So some boys had come for the program. They said the Google company laid off some 12,000 people huh, recently. So some of them were like shocked about this. Maybe some of them may be aware. Some of the big companies laid off like that, isn't it? So now I asked them, when the company was paying you your fat salary, did you save? They said, no, sir, we didn't save. We thought so much money is coming, we spent very lavishly, huh? extravagantly. Uh, so, but some intelligent boys had saved money. Now they have some money. <coughs> so, 
That means, you know, they joined Google some eight years ago. They didn't save well. And the uh, effect of not saving, they are suffering now. <coughs> the data, correct now? And those who saved, they are enjoying the fruits now. That means some results come instantly. Some come tomorrow. Some come after one year. Some come after eight years. In the same manner, some results come, will come after 50 years or 60 years also. But in case the, uh, the body dies, then the results are stored in the mind. And that will go to the next body. And the results will be given to the <coughs> spirit in the, while occupying the next body. Is that clear? Yeah. That is how the karma goes to the next body. Like somebody got a good result in the form of a handsome body, healthy body, educated person, you know, good food and all that. Somebody got a bad body. That's a result of current action. As you so, so shall you be. Uh, here, I was telling about the free will and fate. I'll give you an example. Say, let us assume this is a cow. Huh? Tie it to your pole. This is a pole. Huh? And this cow can graze within a certain amount of radius. Huh? In this radius, cow can eat the grass. So it's a newly purchased cow from the market. In India, sometimes farmers bring a cow. And they tie a one meter rope. Huh? And they see the behavior of the cow. If the cow is very peaceful cow, you know, even children go near, the cow doesn't do anything. Then the farmer, what he will do, he will increase the diameter, uh, radius of the rope. Instead of one meter, he'll make it two meters. And if the cow continues to behave well, then he will release the rope and allow the cow to wander within the compound of the house. It can go around crazier than that. And by seeing the behavior of the cow, tomorrow he may even let the cow go out for grazing in the field and coming back in the evening. In villages in India, sometimes they let the cow do and it goes here and there and ultimately evening it comes back to the same house from where the cow went. So freedom is increased more and more. But there are certain cows which you bring from the market, newly brought cows. When you tie them with one, one meter radius, if some children go near, you know, they have big horns like this. They do like this. They are little uh, dangerous cows. They are angry cows. So then will he increase the radius or not? What do you think? No. No, he won't increase the radius. Is it clear to everybody? Hmm. What will happen if he increases the radius? Just huh? You'll have chaos. Lawsuit. <laughs> yeah, it's dangerous, right? It's more dangerous. So. Will he let the cow loose? Will he remove the rope and allow the cow to wander? If you allow the cow to wander, what will happen? Break things. Ah, it will break things. It's like untethered bull, uncontrolled uh, creature. It will cause a problem. Habit. Therefore, to save others from that cow, uh, they will reduce the radius, not let the girl. So, that reduction of the freedom is called fate. And the increase of the freedom is called free will. Hmm. Is this uh, example clear? I'll give one more example. It will make it more clear. There was one father who had a small boy. You know, the father used to give him five dollars every day as a pocket money. So this boy would go to uh, school. And the father one day picked up the boy on his lap and said, My dear son, you are my only son. I have, you know, five billion dollars of estates. And I am going to write it in your name when you grow up, he said. And the son said, Thank you, father. And uh, as the son started going to school, he started smoking. And the father became worried. Now he stopped giving him five dollars. So the son came home. One of the weekends when the father was looking at the son, the son was staring at the father with a very angry eye. He said, Father, you are a cheater. He said, Why do you call me a cheater? He said, You are not even giving me five dollars. How are you going to give me five billion dollars worth of estates? You are just bluffing, he said. Father said, no, no, my son, please listen to me. If I give you five dollars, you are going to smoke and smoke and smoke and become a chain smoker. Then you will die before me. Then how can I write the five billion worth estate in your name if you die before me? So to make sure you won't die before me, I am not giving you this five dollars. I have taken back. I have restricted you from buying cigarettes now, like that he said. So because the boy misused the money, the fate was increased. And if the boy uses the money properly, then free will will be increased. 
For example, if the boy used that five dollars for a good purpose, father may give him ten dollars. If he if he continues to use properly, he may give him fifty dollars. He may give him, and later on he will even show a cupboard or a bureau where he may say, "Take the money whenever you want." Tomorrow he may even write the bank account in his name also. Correct, no? Or he may hand over all his money. Once the boy earns the trust of the father, then the father will give lot of money to him. Now he has lost the trust. Therefore, there is restriction. So, how many of you found these two examples? One of the cow and one of the boy. You could grasp it. You could understand it. You appreciate it. Is it easy? Or anybody has any doubts about it? If you have doubt, I can explain it for you. So, these two examples are very vital to know. How uh, our uh, free will can be expanded. Every, I'm sure every one of us sitting here, you would like to increase your freedom and free will. Is it not true? Mm, we don't like to be restricted. Does a bird like to be inside a cage, or the bird likes to fly in the free sky? What do you think? Yes. Yeah. Free sky. Free sky. Is it not true? Uh, if you have any doubt about it, anybody else feels the bird likes to be inside the cage? They like to fly in the free sky. So, but for increasing free will, uh, the proper alignment uh, with uh, the, the universal principles, the spiritual principles, is very vital. Then we get the free will more and more. Uh, in that connection, I will tell you uh, the uh, narration from the Shrimad Bhagavatam. In the Shrimad Bhagavatam tenth canto, uh, there is an example of one very great treasurer. Of the uh, heavenly beings, and among the heavenly beings, uh, the treasurer's name is Kubera. Huh? Kubera. So this Kubera lives in a place where Lord Shiva lives in North India, in the mountain of Kailash. Huh? So next to Shiva's abode, Kubera has a place. They are neighbors. So he became good friends with Shiva, and he would go to sit with Lord Shiva and associate. Lord Shiva is a great devotee of Krishna. Lord Shiva, you might have seen pictures of Shiva sitting in meditation. You have seen. So he is called as a yogi Shiva. Yogi, you know what is the meaning of a yogi? Yogis do yoga sanas and breathing exercises, and uh, you all have might have seen. Correct, correct. It's called yogi Shiva, and Lord Krishna is called yogi Shiva. What is the difference between the two? Amongst the yogis, the best yogi is Shiva, and the personality of Godhead Krishna is one who awards the yogic powers to all people. He is called Yogeshwar. He is like the ocean of yogic powers, and he awards to many people. So Shiva meditates on uh, Lord Krishna, uh, sitting in meditation. So Kubera would go to his place to associate with him and learn good things from Shiva. So in this way, Kubera became. Although Kubera had lot of money, he would not misuse the money. He was well behaved and religious and like that. But he had two sons whose names were Nalakuva and Manikriva. They both are uh, heavenly times, uh, heavenly denizens. Their names are Nalakuva and Manikriva. Two of them. But these two sons were thinking, our father is very rich father. So we are rich kids. We can enjoy life, eat, drink, and be merry. That was their formula. That's what they thought they can do. Now, now also you find sometimes the children use their father's money when father has a lot of money. Sometimes in some families we see that. So these fellows went to the holy place called Mandakini Ganga in India, close to Shiva's abode, and and there. In the waters, they were uh, planning to. I mean, they were uh, having uh, bottles of liquor in their hand to drink, and they were also enjoying with uh, heavenly women, you know, apsaras, and all of them were practically nude in the waters, splashing water and enjoying like that. So the great saint Narada appeared there, and the Narada saw the situation there. He thought these human beings. Have got such a handsome bodies, but they are misusing their freedom. Huh? And uh, uh, at that time, those two ladies, seeing a great saint has come, we should not uh, misbehave in front of a great saint. 
immediately put on their clothes and fled from there. Uh, they went away. But these two guys were too drunk. Huh? They didn't go away. They were just standing. Uh, and the Narada contemplated in his mind, what would be the best uh, thing I can do for these people? So then he cursed them to become trees. To occupy the body of trees. The spirit sometimes occupies the body of a human being. Sometimes an animal. Sometimes a bird. Sometimes a tree. Uh, sometimes uh, aquatics. Different, different bodies. The spirit uh, never dies. You cannot cut the spirit with scissors. You cannot burn it with fire. You cannot motion it into water. The spirit survives even after death. You take any world religion, you will see the spirit is answerable to God after death. The spirit survives always. But the mortal coil, what you see, this gets uh, from childhood to youth to old age and it perishes away. It mixes with sand. From dust the word born, from dust thou shalt return, we say. No? That is for this body, which is a mortal coil, which is, a, which is like a shell in which, it's like a machine in which the spirit is seated. So they left the body of uh, Nalakur Manikri and then they occupied the body of a tree. Now some of you may have a question, why did the great saint Narada curse them to become trees? Saintly people are supposed to be compassionate. But how can saintly people be so cruel? Somebody may have a question, isn't it? Anybody has an answer for this question? This is a lesson to teach him. Yeah. Made him into trees. He wanted them to learn a lesson. Uh, that's correct, you are right, yeah. Anybody want to add to that? Any of you? See, when great saintly people offer curses in Vedic literature, you read that. But that curses are also a blessing in disguise. You will see that. Because they became trees in a place called Vrindavan in India, where Lord Krishna was born. And Lord Krishna lived there in Vrindavan. And uh, they got to see many wonderful activities in Vrindavan. And the, and the pastime goes like this. One day, and Lord Krishna... Uh, was tied by his mother to a grinding mortar. He went between the two trees and he broke the trees and out came this Narakur Manigriva again. Huh? They came out. They were again, they revived their old body. I mean, they became demigods again. Huh? It's not that they had to be in trees body forever. Hmm? Now they came to their good senses and they prayed to the Lord and they said, earlier we were drunken. We were completely misled. We misbehaved. Now we have come to our senses. We, with our legs, we will walk to your temple. With our hand, we will make a garland and offer you. With our mouth, we will sing your glory. And they gave up all their bad habits and then they came to uh, sanity after that. So, when they came to sanity, they were given freedom. When they were acting instantly, their freedom was arrested. So, I am about to conclude my talk in another two, three minutes. Uh, and then we can have a discussion. Like you will see a mother, when she sees a child coming into the kitchen and the child wants to take a knife and cut the vegetables, mother doesn't allow the child. She says, hey, don't touch the knife, you will cut your fingers. Or sometimes the child wants to touch the fire. Like we, when we were small children in a gas stove, the fire would be like a blue flower around and it looked like a blue flower, beautiful. So when we would go to touch it, mother would say, hey, don't touch the fire. We would take the knife, hey, don't touch the knife. Then we would say, okay, let me go out and hey, don't go out alone. I'll come with you. So many times when, when mother would say, don't, don't, don't. No, I used to wonder why, why is she, she saying don't so much? Why can't she give us freedom? Because she knows that the child's freedom can be dangerous for the child. Therefore, she would restrict our freedom. Now when we grew up, then we can take a knife and cut the vegetables and we can handle the stove. She knows that we will not hurt ourselves. Even when we go out, we are now mature, we are grown up, we can go out. So, in the same manner, in this world, whatever restrictions are put for us by God, those are actually for our good, our ultimate good. Uh, otherwise, uh, what uh, delight God will get by disciplining us uh, in this world. You will see in America, for example, you have free citizens and then there are citizens in the jail. If you see what the difference between the two, 
the citizens who are free citizens, they also follow some laws, state laws. For example, you follow the traffic laws, uh, laws of the country you follow. And you live happily as a free citizen. But those who are inside the jail, they break the state laws and they're inside the jail. And then they have more uh, stricter confinement and uh, punishment, you can see that. So in this world, the confinement is increased as one uh, goes against what is uh, beneficial for them. Uh, so like, like uh, in this world, the nature is designed in such a way that, you know, your freedom is increased more and more if you act righteously. For example, you do breathing exercises, you do meditation, you do chanting, you take part in this beautiful kirtans, you take a, a sanctified lacto-vegetarian diet, which is a vegetarian diet offered to God and then you take it. You So your mind becomes calm, cool, collected and you feel very happy. And uh, you also gradually develop the ability to deal with other living beings maturely. Yeah? And, and you can live a very happy life yourself and make others happy too. Mm? On the other hand, people who put many substances into the body, which are uh, harmful for the body, yeah? they actually invite many bodily diseases, correct? Uh, many, many complications. The, the substances which people take generally, uh, they are very titillating to the tongue. Uh, and they give some kind of elation, but that is very short-lived. Uh, but the consequences are very disastrous uh, in ruining the health. So, therefore, we have, we, when we know the difference between, when you come to these kind of programs, gradually you come to understand what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. You know, uh, so the words like, you know, regulation or uh, regulated lifestyle or disciplined lifestyle, uh, is often hated by many educated people. People don't like, why do you talk about discipline? Why do you talk about regulation? Um, why do you talk about control? But this is actually called control. You are a controlled and regulated lifestyle for gaining freedom. Uh, so you, you all have seen, uh, anybody has here, uh, you have uh, flown a kite in the sky when you were, uh, you done that? Okay. So when you want to send a kite in the sky, sky high you want it to go. Do you just cut the blade and throw it? Or you keep a spool and release it? Keep a spool. Yeah. So that means he's keeping control. But that means by keeping some amount of control, the kite can go sky high. If you cut it and throw it, it may get stuck in some tree. Correct, no? Isn't it? That means absolute freedom doesn't do good to us. Although we want absolute freedom. Another example we will give you. Your flood is allowed to move in any direction it wants. <coughs> Correct, no? Sometimes there are floods. Can a flood do any good? Think about it. Can a flood do any good at all? Yeah. Yes, please tell me how. Well, if a place, <coughs> if a place has a drought situation, yeah. then a flood would... Be very helpful because there is no water. Right. But the, generally we have seen when the flood comes, it carries away the people kills the people, kills the cattle, yeah. it destroys the houses, because it has no direction. It just flows in any direction. On the other hand, imagine you have conserved water in a dam. Mm -hmm. So then you can release the water whenever you want. Correct? No? You have that freedom. Then only when you want for irrigation purposes, then as much quantity as you want, you can release. Whereas in a flood, you don't have that control. Correct? Like you, I, I believe you all have gas pipes in your homes, correct? You have a regulator also? Or you have no regulator? Yeah, correct. That's the regulator. Yeah. And if, if there were no regulator, if it would come out unlimited and gas comes, it could be very disastrous. You agree? So the regulator means discipline. There is some discipline kept there. So whether it is a gas stove, whether it is a flood. In your garden also, I am sure you all will be trimming your garden regularly to make it look nice, right? Untrimmed garden grows in any direction like this. You know, it doesn't look good. Trimmed garden looks good, correct? No? Similarly, we can also trim our lifestyle. You can design your life. Let us not allow the life to go by default. See, default life means act in whatever way my mind dictates me. Design lifestyle means I use my higher self, the intelligence, to guide my lower self, mind. And uh, 
Like for example, you all know junk food is very tasty, but it is not healthy. You agree? On the other hand, the good food may not be so tasty, but it is very healthy. So generally the mind wants which one? Mind, our mind likes junk food or the healthy food? Junk food. Junk food. Junk food. And our intelligence should tell the mind, my dear mind, you may like that junk food, but it's not good for you. You get obesity, you know, you become unhealthy and it is difficult to digest, you have to take medicines and everything. But you eat the healthy food. Like in Pune, I have one, one of my colleagues, he has been suffering from obesity. Doctor told him, salad you can eat as much as you want, you know. You can, uh, so he gave him many, many salads to eat. So I saw him in the morning eating a bread. I said, I, I told him, you eating cookies and bread. I said, hey, doctor has told you to eat salads. He said, am I a horse to eat all these salads? He <laughs> said, I'm fed up with this salad. I don't like, I only like junk food. So you, the, the doctor told him, if you don't follow the discipline, you cannot control your body size. <laughs> yeah. So you can see that our mind goes by pleasure and intelligence goes by reason. So if I can exercise my intelligence to subdue the mind, then I can increase my free will. You can appreciate this point. You can increase your free will more and more. And if I agree to go by the mind's demands, then it will be pleasure giving in the beginning, but eventually I lose my freedom. I become more and more restricted. So I stop with this. We can have some discussion. If any of the points I made made some sense to you, you can speak your reflections, any of you. Yeah. Yes. I have a question about yeah. like karma essentially, right? So if someone gets another body, I see cases of people who have a really bad deal, but they want the mic on. Others cannot forget you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so some people get a bad deal. They're born like what well, maybe like twelve years to live or some crazy cancer. Or maybe you see stories of like young people who get trapped in a situation where they pretty much it's hopeless and their attitude is just completely positive and it makes no sense how they can gain that level of, of maturity so young. And then you see other people who just spend the whole time angry. How does that work? Why is it that some people, even though they get a bad lot, they're virtuous and some people just go at it with like an angry yeah. approach. See in India, they have uh, they have something called as a silo they call it. Silo is like a big barrel in which they put rice and stock it. You know, say, say for example, if somebody stocked the half of the barrel uh, with uh, say low quality rice of the previous year, you know, it's with a lot of stones and pebbles and everything mixed with rice. So they had stopped it half. Now they may put fresh rice, it's high quality rice. But when they take it from the bottom, they open a knob kind of thing and then the rice which comes out. That rice will always be the old rice, what they have put last year and kept. Now the fresh rice may be very good, still the old rice is not good, which is coming out. You may wonder, I am putting such nice rice, but why is bad rice is coming because that is put before it's coming in the same manner now people who get uh, handicapped bodies or some diseased body have a good attitude which you said now in this life they have cultivated good attitude but the suffering they are enduring comes from the previous record so they are suffering now but for the current good attitude they are going to get some brighter future which will come eventually it will come and the other people you, who you said who are healthy and uh, living a long life, but having angry attitude and everything. See, this anger, all this, the greed and all, lust and all these things are carried by the mind at the time of death. Uh, like Lord Krishna gives the example, like a wind carries fragrance of flowers, or sometimes wind carries a nasty smell of some dead animal in the forest. So like that, the mind carries the impressions from previous life. Even all of us sitting here, some of you, some of you are very mild natured, very gentle in speech and very sensitive. You know? And somebody may be a little aggressive and forceful and passionate and insensitive to others. So these are all scripts the mind carries from previous life to this life. 
So now the last stage of the previous life, whatever scripts you had, that will be the beginning stage of scripts in this current life. Now, for example, Sir Adishan Das, I had a very aggressive spirit in the beginning of this life, which I carried from the previous life. Now, from here to here, here my life is ending. So, here I am given the time for doing homework to modify that. Uh, like a greedy person can become a satisfied person. An angry person can become a peaceful person. A selfish person can become a selfless person. Arrogant person can become a humble person. You know, a rigid person can become a flexible person. So this is called the heart transformation, which happens when we sing this Hare Krishna mantra. You know, we, we cleanse the mind. Hmm. And that is why we all should do the homework. The reason we are talking about fate and free will today, if you want to increase the free will, we have to have this heart transformation. That is necessary for us. So before even you do the heart transformation, we should be able to observe ourselves at a point outside the body. Go outside your body and look at you. What type of person am I? What do people tell me? You know, my colleagues tell about me, my parents tell about me, and then what do I feel also? So any of you have done self-awareness exercise about yourself? What type of person am I and in which areas can I improve? Any of you have done that? Very good. There are good numbers. Almost more than half of them. <laughs> so when you do that, then you become a better and better person by, by doing that. That means in this lifespan given to you by God, you have made improvement. Even if I make 20% improvement, next life I start from 21%. If I have done 60, then I start from 61%. When you are 100%, you are purified. Then you are fit to go to the spiritual plane after that, where you experience ocean of enjoyment, where there is no old age, no disease, no death, no sufferings. It's a joyful world. We decide all water is honey. And nobody walks there. Everybody dances there. Nobody talks there. Everybody sings there. It's a very beautiful platform it is from where we have come. Like rainwater is pure. But touching the ground, it becomes muddy. Similarly, we all are children of God, originally pure. Now, I'm not only saying you are originally pure, even now you are pure. But we are covered by mind which carries that impurity. Uh, just like, for example, now due to the chill winter, we all are wearing socks now. Of course, all of you have a clean socks. Say, for example, if I have a nasty smelling socks, people will say, hey, who is this, uh, who is this fellow who is nasty smelling? The fellow is not nasty smelling, his socks is nasty smelling. Yeah. Fellow is a good person. So if he goes out and removes his socks and washes his feet and comes in, then there will be no more smell. So really the spirit is very good. But covering the spirit is a mind which carries the impurities. And uh, we are all chanting Hare Krishna to cleanse the impurity in the mind. When the mind becomes clean, you become a beautiful soul. By that. And the goal of life is to cleanse the mind. And become like the original uh, child of God who has been pure always. Huh? And uh, then we can actually become a spreader of cheerfulness and happiness for all living beings. Uh, understanding and accepting everybody is a lovable child of God. Huh? That kind of understanding. So, therefore you find people with different, different natures in this world. Hmm. Is that, does it make sense though? Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, this can reach you. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I came a little late. You can take that off. Thank you. Reading something. My name is George. Nice to meet you all. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Bo. I uh, want to say that I understand I have baggage. If that's okay, I could use that word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all of us have our baggage. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. This is speak of uh, who I am, uh, from these predispositions and uh, from birth or along the way. Um, I have looked at myself and my personality. I have balanced different aspects of my personality to King Sorry, yeah. balancing it all, trying to make a streamline. Yeah. Very long, I'd say. Um, maybe I feel also some uh, influences from previous uh, encounters and times in my life or spirit. Uh, I can personally attest to that. And uh, I would like to say uh, I really do understand this. And I thank you for, you know, breaking it down like that. It's really beautiful. Uh, such a great uh, 
humble predisposition that you come from, and I really appreciate that. Um, this one last point that you made, what was the last point that you spoke of. Uh, you said if you balance something, then you get that free thinking, you free your mind. So what was it that you were mentioning, that last point that you mentioned? Uh, you said if you do this, correct this in this manner. We get freedom. Yeah, and your mind, yes. Right, 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 right. Yes. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. You see, there are uh, uh, two types of uh, uh, attitudes. One is called divine, and one is called demoniac. Huh? So, uh, the divine attitude actually means uh, acceptance of God, alignment with God, acting for the pleasure of God, acting on behalf of God. So, these are right attitudes. Huh? Acceptance of God means, as I told you, as soon as you are born in this world, you see, you know, the sun shines, the cloud showers, you know, the crops grow, the grains fructify, the fruits ripen, the flowers blossom, seasons change. So when you see all these things, you will see some of the spirits immediately they will say that, oh, you know, such a kind father, he has provided us all these things. We are grateful to him. So that is a divine attitude. Demoniac attitude means, you know, uh, they just don't take into account God's hand in this world. They, they think that we have made this world. We have made big factories and industries. We have made skyscraper buildings. Like in New York, we see such tall towers we find, uh, skyscrapers. But if you honestly see how they could make these skyscrapers, they have taken the materials from God only. With those materials, they have put them together and made these buildings. Is it not true? Huh? the sand and the reinforced bars and the, all the metal stones and everything they put to make it. It's all taken from God. So, the, the demoniac are those who don't recognize the hand of God. And divine are those who recognize the hand of God. Like for example, Einstein was a genius of the century. But who gave him the brain by which he could become this uh, genius of the century? Did Einstein create his own brain? Now, did Einstein open his head and put the brain inside? <laughs> He didn't do that. God gave him the brain and God gave him the eyes, the ears and nose. And so the instruments Einstein had and the brain he had and the materials he's processing in the laboratory, all were given by God. Therefore, those who are divine, they recognize the hand of God. And when they recognize the hand of God, they also want to know uh, how to, it is called as uh, conformity and unity principle, we call it. With God, we should have conformity. With other living beings, we should have unity. These two things, if we do, we will be happy and we can make the world happy also. But you find those who don't have conformity with the Supreme Lord, you know, they also have quarrel with other living beings. You will see, they both go hand in hand. Because they don't want to, they don't want to live a, a pure life in alignment with the will of God. And at the same time, they also you know, don't cooperate with other living beings because they become, tend to become greedy. They want to loot others' property. They want to control the other living beings. Uh, they want to enjoy whimsically anything that may not be good for them also. So these three propensities of proprietorship, controllership, enjoyership, the more the living beings expand as if they are the pivot of the world and everything should revolve around them and everyone should be at their beck and call. Uh, this is Modern day books also, school textbooks, they make you feel that man or a human being is the center of the universe and everything revolves around you, correct? Is that true? Are we the center or God the center? God's the center. Yeah, God the center. Actually, He has created this world. He has put us here. He is providing us facilities. He is maintainer and we are maintained. He is predominator, we are predominated. You know, He is controller, we are controlled. He is master. And we are servant. So this relationship one who understands is divine. So as soon as you understand this first relationship, see for example here is a bulb here. If I put on the switch it will be on. If I put off the switch it will be off. So anybody can safely say that Radhishan Das, you know, he is the controller of the bulb. Correct now? But imagine if there is a power shutdown from the government. You know, my putting on and off, will it have any consequence? Similarly, yes, we are 
minor controllers, but we are not ultimate controllers. Ultimate controller is him. And I am a minor controller. So when we accept this, uh, and then we want to know what are, see what is the law that we have to follow in this world. There is only one law, which is love of God. You know, we have to love God and not envy God. We should not try to become imitators of God. That's the only law. But before we follow that law, there are some smaller laws which will lead to that platform. Therefore, we are given, you know, do this, don't do this, which many people don't like. But actually, by following those uh, baby steps to that love of God, you know, we will come to a point where we can experience love for God and love for all. Uh, so then your freedom is increased. Like I was telling you about Narada, he is a, a great saintly person, great sage. Then uh, I will tell you a little bit about his uh, interesting story. <clears throat> At one point of time, there was one fellow, uh, there is one group of uh, heavenly beings called as uh, Gandharvas. Gandharvas are very powerful musicians. Just like when our people beat the Mrindangam and play harmonium, sometimes I feel some of them might have been Gandharvas. <laughs> you know, Gandharvas are very good musicians. They can play instruments very well, sweetly. They have, you know, and they have a handsome body also. They have curly hairs. Uh, handsome <laughs> body. Uh, they are very sweet singers, uh, musicians. So he was one of them, one person. And because he was very handsome, he was always surrounded by beautiful Apsaras. Apsaras are heavenly damsels, uh, women. They are also beautiful women. So this uh, Gandharva was moving around in the heavens like a in the modern terms, what you call the playboy, you know. A playboy, he had by four or five women always surrounding him, going around. So he went to one assembly where the devatas, the demigods were having a serious meeting. At the end of the meeting, they were glorifying God through poetry. So this fellow went there and he started singing some other song. Uh, some other song which had no connection with God but which was just like some cinema song, you know, that kind of song. So then one of the devatas cursed him to become a... He, uh, the devata said, because you have become arrogant in your behavior, you become a uh, servant maid, son in a rustic village, like that. So that Gandharva glided down, came down to earth and he was born as a small boy in the family of one uh, servant maid, you know, ordinary poor woman, he was born. But one good thing happened to the child. In the rainy season, some great devotees of the Lord, they came to the village. And his mother cooked the nice food and told the boy, go and give it to the saintly people. So he rendered the service to saintly people. By getting touch, uh, in touch with them, he got purified. And he heard very nice sermons from them. And he understood how to align his life with God. And he became purer and purer. After the, they all went away, Based on the good instructions, he went to the forest and meditated around the Supreme Lord. And he became a pure devotee. The, and the Lord told him, my dear boy, in this life you will not see me. But throughout your life you practice this kind of spiritual practice. At the end of life, I will award you with a very beautiful body and you will become my pure devotee. Lord blessed him. So he continued going to holy places. He would take uh, darshan of the Lord. He would take holy dip and holy rivers and everything. At the end of life, he left that body and became Narada in the next life. He was the one who became Narada. When he became Narada saint, uh, Supreme Lord called him and gave him one Veena. You know, one of the devotees plays Veena here. Who is that? Isn't it? Ah, he plays Veena. You have it here? Ah, correct. He plays Veena. Somebody was playing flute. So he was playing Veena. So the Lord gave him on that Veena, his instrument, and told him, take this instrument, now I give you freedom to go anywhere you wish. You can go to heaven, you can go to spiritual world. Now you are a free bird. There is no restriction for you anywhere. And you can go by flying. Huh? So you could fly here, fly there, everywhere, all over the universe, and you could uh, distribute the knowledge about God by singing along with the instrument also. So here his free will was 100% free will for him. Why? Because he came to a stage where he will not misuse his free will. So when God is fully convinced that we will not misuse the free will, he gives us absolute freedom. Uh, and uh, 
And when Narada got a pure spiritual body, how do you know that? Because once when he went to one, uh, one, 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 one demon called Ravana, that Ravana told him, if you don't teach me the secret of spiritual knowledge, I will kill you, he said. Narada said, what are you talking? You know, in front of a spiritual master, you should actually salute and you should bow down. With arrogant attitude, you cannot learn. So, Ravana took a sword and then he cut the body of Narada. And nothing happened to Narada. Like, like a light beam. If there is a beam of light, you cut across the beam. Will anything happen to the beam? Nothing will happen. Narada was laughing. He said, you can't cut my body because I have a spiritual body now. Huh? He said, I have no more gross body. I have no more subtle body. I have a spiritual body. So every one of us sit, sitting here, we all have a spiritual body. Spirit, we call it. So once you attain that body, you have freedom to fly anywhere you wish and the, the body cannot be harmed by weapons. It cannot be burned by fire. Even if you jump from a 100-story building, you will very smoothly come in slow motion down and nothing will happen to you. Hmm? But now we have this grass body made of flesh and bones. Hmm? So we are suffering uh, diseases and all these things. But we all can get that type of spiritual body when you become fully purified. And we don't need the grass body, such a body. Is that clear? Does it make sense? Yeah. I, uh, I like to say... Uh, there is something I've read recently. I thought you mentioned it here. Oh, yes, yeah. I read a book called The uh, Celestine Prophecy. Oh, All right. <laughs> How you doing, brother? Good, good. And um, in, in the book, they explain um, a man's journey uh, seeking some type of manuscripts in Peru on a political uh, gunplay and whatnot action. But they talk about uh, these uh, 12 insights uh, in which people will become uh, first aware collectively in this process of steps of spiritual uh, evolution um, in manners uh, first in uh, approaching and involving with other people and uh, how to raise children and how to how society will evolve could potentially evolve spiritually uh, and finding the no need for a lot of other uh, things and um it talks about how people have successfully evolved spiritually and they vibrate at such a higher rate mm -hmm. that they can be even unseen by people who vibrate at the perhaps known to be the average vibration to these standards. Um, people in the book, it's a storyline, and it mentions maybe the people who disappeared in South America and left their temples abandoned. They're saying these people have evolved and that's they were still there, just people couldn't see them. Or even maybe the story of Jesus and how he spiritually evolved and advanced, and that there's actual steps that you can do it physically. And, somehow reach that point but i don't understand if it's maybe a medium is there some type of medium where people are still in their fleshly bodies but closely advanced spiritually to almost experience these dimensions yeah it's possible that's like if you put an iron rod in fire <laughs> the, the iron rod becomes fiery isn't it iron rod behaves like fire Iron rod is not fire, but iron rod behaves like fire if you put it in fire for a long time. First it becomes red hot, then it becomes yellow hot, then it becomes white hot, you know. It looks like blazing fire. Similarly, while you while the spirit is seated in this body, uh, there are spiritual practices which if you do regularly, like uh, one is the singing of the Hare Krishna Kirtan we were doing in the beginning. We are doing. So we also do chanting with the beat. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And so this type of mantra chant is that all over the world you can see that. Buddhists also chant. Namo Abhada Bhutsu, they also chant. Sikhs chant, Vahe Guru. 
Vasudev Hari Govinda Ram. Ah, hey, Guru. They also chant. Similarly, and you might have seen Krishna chant Hail Mary. They also chant. Hmm? Yes. And uh, in uh, Islam, they chant yes. Namaz. Yes. They have a, gl a glossy rosary they have. Yeah. That means everywhere, anybody who wants to spiritually evolve, hmm? uh, you also have it, right? Yeah. See, you have seen this Benedictine monks and uh, Franciscan friars and Seventh-day Adventists and all. They have something called as a ceaseless prayer. You know, ceaseless prayer means it is a 24 by 7 day, the mental prayer. So these people become very powerful. <coughs> Those who can actually call the name of God and, and uh, not just occasionally, but regularly uh, for longer periods of time. You know, they purify their heart very fast because this is a supreme purifier. Chanting the God's names. It's like taking a wet cloth and wiping a dusty mirror. You know, when you wipe it, then the mirror is completely cleaned up. You can see your face very clearly. You can see that. And that's the reason they become spiritually empowered even while seated in this body of flesh and bones. So, how do you know that they have become cleansed? There are certain uh, natures of conditioned uh, living beings. Like we become unnecessarily angry. We become jealousy. They become greedy. We harbor malice for other living beings. We feel revengeful thoughts and hatred and things like that. So they will be able to come to a stage where they, these are completely absent. These are completely absent in them. And in fact, they can pray even for those who are trying to harm them. You know, they can have such a degree of forgiveness. Not only forgive, forgive, forget, be friendly. Many people can forgive but cannot forget. They remember. In 2015, July month after <laughs> that day, you <laughs> and people remember very much. They note in diary and keep. <laughs> but actually, exalted personalities can forgive and forget. Some people can forgive and forget, but they think that I will not connect with that person anymore in my life. They shut their doors. But forgive, forget, and be friendly means they can even embrace that person. So these noble qualities cannot come without spiritual evolution. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. This 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 will be the final question, and then we'll do a little kirtan, and then we go. Why they have a long pain for that? Okay, okay. I, I actually why a person suffers, why a person enjoys, for us it's very difficult to see because we see the present isolated from the past and future. You know, we don't know the past, we don't know the future. You only see the present, correct? Huh? So, the, so our our ability to comprehend about people's life situations is very limited. But one thing you can know for sure: if a person has lived out his life properly now, you know, in this life, he is going to reap good fruits eventually. One will reap. And also, when you talk about good, good is a very relative term. Good is a very relative term. Good. So therefore, we should know when we talk about good, what is the ultimate good? Uh, that question can be asked. So, 
standard morality is by which the Supreme Lord is pleased. That is standard morality, gold standard of what is morality. Uh, because uh, um, there are many people working for pockets of people. Like somebody is working for one type of caste people or one type of state people, one type of country people. So Rabindranath Tagore wrote a poem. He said, where the world is free from fear, where the knowledge is free, where the world is not divided by narrow domestic walls into fragmental parts. Like that he wrote. So what it exactly means is we should transcend the barriers of caste, creed, color, nationality, gender and all these things. And that is only possible when you become Krishna conscious or God conscious. When you become God conscious, you see that see all living beings are related to one supreme God. So if you love him, you can love all. We call it as the love God, love all. Anything short of that is incomplete love. If I love my nation, it is incomplete love. Because I will love India, but I will not love the neighborhood nation. Then people make bombs and throw there. Correct, no? So there is incomplete love. Or even if you say you are a humanitarian person, you love all humans. Still such people may feel cows and other creatures. And so you may not love some living beings. But when you love God, you can't harm even an ant. You can't harm anybody because all living beings are related to that one supreme. So then it's called love agape, we call it. It's like universal love where we can't, we don't hate any living being. And that love is complete love. And we should live for that love. Otherwise, most, many of the leaders had good heart and good intentions, but they lived for some type of incomplete love. They lived for. There is only one person who can be easily satisfied, which is God himself. Otherwise, you try to serve people of a nation, people of a particular denomination, they are always dissatisfied. And they also harm back. So we have to expand our love until it reaches, uh, you know, the goal of pleasing God. And that is standard morality. So thank you for your brilliant question. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and attending today. Um, of course, the best way to show appreciation is to tell a friend. So we have these programs every week and you're all welcome to come. Um, we're so grateful that we had these few days with His Grace Radhe Shyam Prabhu. Um, and uh, I'm sure you all um, felt enlightened by today's talk. Now, after this, we will have a, a short kirtan now, um, five to ten minutes, um, and then followed by a um, feast, a, a small little snack feast, um, vegetarian, um, it's called Prashadam, um, which means mercy, mercy of the Lord. And um, yeah, so we'll, we'll do that afterwards, uh, after the kirtan, and then, um, yeah, and then we be, feel free to, to speak with the devotees who will be there, and they'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And many of them are also very evolved people here, yeah. whom you are getting here, yeah. very thinking people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very thoughtful. Okay, all right, Krishna. Thank you. 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 Thank you.